Morena Wairarapa. Good morning. It's Rob Mansell here from Move, Mingle and Play, our weekly information about what's happening show on Arrow FM. It's another lovely morning. We've come through a bit of a stormy patch and today it's not going to be hot, but it's going to be warm and sunny and clear skies and it looks like it's going to stick around for the weekend. I've... uh, been able to have a very special uh, friend come and and join me in the studio this morning, Mr. Jason Kerahi from uh, the Māori Health Services at the DHB, Uh, also a musical colleague, uh, a man who's much more experienced in the music scene in the Wairapa uh, over the years than I am. Uh, Welcome, Jason. Kia ora. ora, Thank you very much for coming in at short notice. Thanks for having me. We, we had the idea of um, having Jason in uh, during Māori Language Week, which was a couple of weeks ago, and I think we should uh, touch on that subject because um, one week's really not enough, is it, for focusing on Māori language? No. Um, well, yeah, kia ora, uh, nai, everybody. Um, yeah, Māori Language Week, you know, it's, uh, I guess it's the spark to... To, to rev us up to consider what Māori language is and uh, give it a give it a go. Um, even at even at my work at Wadda Upper DHB, every year we try and do activities, and it kind of crept up on us this year. This year's been unusual <coughs> for everybody, um, but really it it doesn't have to be one week. You know, we no. can just try and do things. Uh, even if that even if Māori language week is just the genesis for us to try more things and start start the rest of the year off you know with good intentions so um yeah we're going to put some thought to that and see what we can do in terms of generating interest in in the, in the language and um giving it a go so what's been your experience as a maori growing up in the wairapa because i remember as a child that uh, maori was uh, as it was almost certainly discouraged from being spoken in schools you know that was the, the bad old days, as it were, and uh, I mean we we have had a very positive change from that, and it now seems that every second person either is, is learning Maori or wants to. We we had a um, an offer at work at Masterton Medical of a class uh, for whoever wanted to take part, and we've got seventeen people who've signed up for it, which is quite spectacular, and I'm not sure that would have happened three or four years ago. Yeah. Um, it's not been a, um, well, for me it hasn't been a, a, a big part of my life, although I've been around the marae and listened to some of the best speakers of it. Mm-hmm. And, um, well, you know, it's the, the people that I grew up listening to, my uncles and, and my, my, my kuros generation, you know, they, they spoke eloquently like... Mm. It's like the it's like the Shakespeare version of speaking English. You know, they were mm. they would use metaphor. They would, you know, they would use poetry and um, and and deep fuckapapa when they spoke. Yes. Uh, but you know, there, there's been a huge resurgence of, of the language. You know, and and uh, some of our our aunties who have pushed pushed it through the Kohanga movement from the early eighties. Um, that's just been the best thing, right? Yeah. To to resurrect the language, to keep it alive, to keep it going, and I think um, of of more recent times, I guess we see, um, you know, the the, the prominence of uh, Matatini. So you aware of Tamatatini? It's the it's the it's the biannual <coughs> Kapahaka festival that's oh, yeah. every two years, yeah, and it goes from place to place to place, mm. and um, it's an international event now. Yeah, you know, and it um, it has a worldwide audience, and it is, hmm. in my opinion, one of the preeminent um, platforms for the language. Yeah, and not only is it about performing and speaking into the, you know, it's about composing in the yes. language. Yeah, and that's going back to what I said before about people understanding the language to such a degree that they can speak in metaphor and speak in yes. you know prose and um and, and verse and lyric and of course with the language uh, references are being made 
to your view of the world and your understanding of life and your connections with nature and, uh, and a whole awareness of being a human being, which we don't have in English. We, 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 don't, we don't have the, that way of looking at things and we don't have a language that describes those things either, but you have both. Uh, you know, so Tamatatini again is is a platform where um, composers often the next generation who are describing the world as it is today, um, and and uh, and and their thinking, you know, and their attitude, and they they're challenging the norms, mm. all in all mm. in the real. Mm. Um, it's incredible, mm. and, and not only that, and, and I'm I'm no expert at, at te reo, um but when I'm, I mean, I went to the last one that was in Wellington, and um, and my friends could understand, and they were like, "Well, my goodness, you know." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> As in, well, what do they say? Well, well, you know, they were challenging. Uh, they were challenging the norms, challenging the system, yes. challenging uh, the generation before them. You know, mm. it's great. It's mm. a great platform. Mm. And it gives um, Maori people a, a certain. A uh, sense of power is not quite the right word, but it, it's insight into what is really happening, and it must be quite a challenge to see uh, the decision makers in the in the European world who who don't seem to be taking account of all the things that they need to to understand human dynamics, social dynamics. And dare I say it, spiritual dynamics, you know, what, what's happening from the spiritual point of view, which with your language, you have a way of describing it. And with that, an interest and a sensitivity to the spiritual world, which, which we're really on quite a threshold at the moment, aren't we, in terms of the battle between those who not only believe, but have an experience of the spiritual world, mm -hmm. and those who are just shut off from it, and almost working against it. Is that something of, of your experience? I mean, you, you said the Māori orators are challenging and, you know, inviting in change. In sense? Yeah, well, that, that comes into it um, as a reference point. I, I'm not sure. I, I'm, no. I, I, I can't speak with any authority on what, what they... Uh, what they write about and, and what they challenge about, I, I don't understand it. So I see. <clears throat> I'm, right. I'm not so, the person to yeah. to comment on that. Yeah. Um, all I do know is is that it is a platform that they um, can be creative, you know. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, uh, and be fresh. And you know, as a writer, that um, every time you pick up a pen, it's a new day. You know. Mm, mm. So this happens every two years. Mm. Uh, and the next one will be different. Hmm. You know, I dare say that, that, you know, as you and I and everybody listening is well aware that the world has changed in the last 12 months, hmm. Hmm. I am sure that that would be part of the pros that comes out, comes out of the next um, yeah. event. And do we have a local initiative to work towards that? Are, are there towards the kapahaka? Groups performing training here? Um, listen, we're, we've, uh, we're fortunate enough to have um, some excellent people um, and they are the younger generation, so mm. um, we have uh, we, we have a we have a young guy who um, his name's Tekoro uh, Roberts, and he's um, he's from here. His, his mum's from here. His dad's from up north, and he he, he was uh, he went through the the kohanga, kohanga system and went to Hawani Waititi Kura. He's an excellent excellent exponent of uh, the language and. Um, and kapahaka and him and others um, mm. that are here we just you know this next generation of um, exponents are coming through and they are taking it to another level mm. so much so that um, uh, our, our local group um, made the nationals last last time out mm -hmm. um, and made a huge impact mm. huge huge impact made us all proud mm. um, not only that, but there's uh, the secondary schools level as well, mm -hmm. and our group here again, um, once again made the national um, finals, um, and are really just making a you know a fantastic impact on on the national scene, mm. um, and 
and that just permeates out through our community you know there's, there's so much mm. pride here mm. but also um everyone everyone has to lift their game to get into that into mm. that group you know so mm. it's, it's fantastic it's fantastic for the future and they're well supported yeah absolutely yeah, there's yeah. some there's some hardy people behind it who just give their time and effort and, and volunteer yeah to to support the kids and support the the performers um and along the way um you know as a consequence of that are growing the next generation of leaders because to stand up on the national stage to stand up on the international stage and perform like that yeah. you have to have confidence and you have to have the backing of your you know mm. your fellow performers um so yeah it's it's a it's a proud time for for what it up and the, these folk are in their 20s uh, are they getting into their 30s or are they younger than that um that, that's about right it's yeah. um mm. you know it's uh although there's some there's some stalwarts that hang on into the 40s and, and 50s whatever yeah. but um certainly here it's it's the younger generation that are that are leading the way mm. um and, and there's a camaraderie, you know, mm. uh, of that generation. Mm. Um, they look good. Mm. They look amazing. They sound amazing. Mm. Uh, they look after themselves. They're, they're proud of what they do. Mm. Um, they're role models for 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 everyone. Well, I, I would ask that you um, get them to get in touch with us so we can inform people about this, sure. well, certainly when they're performing. I know they have quite good um, publicity, don't they, when they put on a show it's, it's packed out, isn't it? Everybody seems to turn up, but Absolutely. I'm sure that there is a wider audience of, of people who'd love to know it's coming up and be able to get there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, like last year, uh, we had the regionals here at um, at Columba Road Netball Courts, mm. and um, you know it was a huge turnout. I think it was actually I think it was February this year. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. So these were performers First. from Wadapa, yeah. Upper, yeah. Hawke's Bay, all the way up, and um, I brought you know hundreds of people here, thousands of people turned out mm. to watch it. Um, you, you you can't get a seat. Mm. <laughs> you got to get in early. Yeah. <coughs> um, Good. Well, it's great to know about that, Jason. I thought we might illustrate this part of our show with a, a, a song from Dave Dobbin, who actually played in Carterton last night. Right. He's got his road show, and they're playing in Fielding tonight, and Waipawa tomorrow night and then on up to Gisborne so that's a plug for Dave Dobbin show I'm sorry I didn't make it Dave but here is him singing no my
Mr. Dave Dobbin, the one and only, performing in Carterton last night, and that, that was No My with his uh, band of uh, great musicians and, and uh, singers performing some years ago. Um, Jason, just getting back to, to, to what we were talking about before, so it seems that uh, the young folk who are now the performers are uh, looking at... Um, well, being invited into more leadership roles and uh, taking responsibilities within the community. Um, but you've got a project that you is very close to your heart at the moment, the, the Māori Health Plan. W would you like to say a little bit about that, how, how that's going, where you've got to? Sure. Um, so so this, is, um, this is my role as... Um, Director of Māori Health at Wadarapa DHB and um, as an organisation we, we need to think about the future so um, under the leadership of my, my Chief Executive Dale Olive, um, Dale has, has really pushed the organisation to have a plan um, so we've got a, um, a newly minted strategic direction, strate strategic plan that captures all of the um, the data that we know about our community, you know, some of the health challenges that our that our populations are dealing with, uh, you know, old age, mm. you know, the the cancers, the the um, uh, the number of births, you know, all, all of the things that you find in a normal in, in a normal population. So our strategic direction is about bringing uh, the services um, and our investment to a. Uh, a, you know, a reasonable conclusion, right? To to put put our money, put our efforts, put our uh, resources in the right places that suits the population that are here in the Wadadapa. So we have um, an ageing community, but we also have uh, a growing younger community, particularly in Māori. You know, so for for Māori for Māori people, um, and this is this is the, the case all over the country. 60 percent of Māori are under thirty. So, um, so we need to think really carefully about um, how we invest our time and effort and concentrate on mm. those early years, you know, mm. from, from, from conception to birth to, you know, um, under fives, making sure that our, mm. our tamariki get off to the best start in life, that our mm. mums are supported, our, our men are supported to look after the family, mm. to provide, to... Um, to, to role model for our, for our children and as you know as a doctor uh, Rob you know um, taking care of those really simple things early on leads mm. to a better life mm. you know so when we grow up so things like you know looking after our, our, our oral health our teeth mm. our nutrition our mental well-being all these things matter mm. as you grow older mm. um, and so you know we, we really just want to get our whanau off to a good start mm. understand um, how they can take care of themselves, take mm. control of themselves, um, have the confidence to to 
to look after themselves and to, and, and to go and seek the help that they need when they need to, mm. to, to get it. Um, so part of the, the strategic planning is for us to develop a Māori health plan. And that Māori health plan needs to be absolutely reflective of the people that live here. And, you know, obviously our, our Māori population. So mm. um, over the next few months, up until Christmas, we want to go out and consult widely. We want to make sure that we cover the whole Wairarapa as much mm. as we can. Mm. You know, it's really ambitious, but um, we need to get to the, to, the, to the people that use our services. We need to understand mm. the people that are challenged by our service um, mm. for whatever reason. Uh, it's too hard to get into. It's too expensive. I don't understand it. We just need to go out and mm. ask people what's important to them. Mm. Um, so... Over the next three months, um, my team, the DHB, and uh, uh, our providers, and also our iwi, um, our iwi leaders, are going to collaborate and try and get out to our community, mm. um, all the way from uh, the, the bottom of South Wairarapa all the way up to to Pukaha and beyond, and hopefully mm. up to our, our rural community and out to the coast. And people know what they need, don't they? If you ask them in the right way, if you ask them where you're really interested in their answer, yeah. and you give them time to think about it and to articulate what their view is, what their understanding is, and, and what their problems are. Because there are some big problems that people have to deal with. And often it's they know what they want to do, but they can't do it. So, you know, working in the health system... Hmm. Uh, the health system tends to come up with the answers itself, right? Yeah. Oh, we know that cancer is important. We know that mm. um, diabetes. We know that you know uh, uh, CO, COPD is you know mm. really has a huge impact. So we we, mm. we focus on those things, but really, um, you, you can't be actually going out and speaking to the people, mm. and the people will tell you the truth. Mm. And um, even though we have all the data and the evidence mm. and, uh, you know, the stories to, to inform a plan, mm. we need to go and ask the people and say, actually, what's important to you? Yes, <clears throat> yes. What's, what's real life to you? Yeah. And you may, you may be surprised at the answer. And they yes. may actually have yeah. priorities that are a little bit different than what you as a system have come up with. Yes. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think it's important, it's absolutely important that we go and ask them. Yeah. Um, we, we've done some thinking about that and asked, we've done some thinking about the questions that we might ask. Mm. So um, uh, in Māori Health, one of the people that, that's really leading the, the narrative is, is um, Sir Mason Jury. Mm. Sir Mason Jury is a significant person in, mm. in, in the Māori world. He's a, you know, our, our academic leader mm. uh, from Manawatu and he developed um, several frameworks, right? Mm. Um, Te Whare Tapawha, you might have heard of that mm. uh, as, as a framework. But he's also done a framework um, uh, in, in the health system, and it's it's called Pai Ora. And Pai Ora is essentially the world around us that impacts on us, on our health and well-being, right? And there's three parts to it. There's, um, you know, I'm not, I, I get these wrong, <laughs> but um, so there's Wai Ora, there's Modi order and there's Fano order. Fano order is about the family. Um, Wai order is about the individual, and Modi order is about the environment. And I might have got those two wrong, but anyway, um, it's those three different levels. And so I guess we want to go out to ask people, ask Fano, what doesn't, what does health mean to you as an individual, mm. right? Mm. And the answer will always be different depending on what age you are, depending on what experience you are, depending where you live. Mm. Because we know that um, people who live in Marston in a big population near a hospital do things differently to people down in the south wider up and go, actually, mm. it's too far away. I'm going <laughs> to figure it out differently. Mm. Um, what does health mean to me as, my, as a family? You know, what's my aspirations? And then what does health mean to me as a community? Mm. Right? What do mm. I want for my community? What's the well-being that I want for my community? Mm. The, the challenge that we find in the health system is that we, we we talk a lot about illness and it's, you know, the big challenge is how do we talk about wellness, you know, what makes us healthy mm. um, in the positive sense because um, 
the health system is really expensive, and if we can if we can find out those those you know those gems of what makes us healthy, what makes us well, it means that um, you don't need to jump into the health system, mm. and yeah. if you do. Um, you're not there for too long, you know, because mm. you're resilient, mm. you know, you're confident. Actually, now it's, it's all I need. I, I can take care of myself, mm. um, but I know I know where to go um, if I need to. And that's what we've got to mm. try and turn around, eh, is to build mm. that confidence in people so that they know where to go, yes. when to go, yes, yes, and know what to ask for. Yeah. Sometimes people don't ask you know, no. enough. Well, they might even try, and when they're not well, obviously they're not very strong, uh, their voice is weak, they might be even a bit frightened, fear comes into it, and uh, that understanding of the need to communicate is not appreciated by the health system. So the health system workers just get on with doing the job. Yeah. And to some extent, um, the personality and the, the culture of the patient uh, are something of a, a nuisance. <laughs> I'm, I'm being a bit cheeky here, mm. you know, but they get in the way of what we have to do to get the person well, to treat the person, whether it's medicines, drips, in, in intensive care, uh, surgery on wait lists, all, all that thing becomes the dominant um, effort that's being made. And the point is missed that here's a person who's having a very intense experience has a background which is actually important as to how they got to where they are and needs to be understood and they need some help on that human personal level <coughs> uh, and and if we can help articulate that uh, and bring that influence into the new way in which health services are delivered I think we're going to see uh, a much better health system much more effective mm. and possibly uh, less expensive, you know. I think we can um, we can avoid uh, a lot of um, mistreatments, misdiagnosis, um, you know, over exaggeration of the need for expensive interventions, the timing of interventions, simply by communicating and having a person on board. And of course, there's that motivating factor, isn't there? If you meet a person and uh, and there's uh, an empathy and an understanding and a connection, they're much more motivated to take up their life again yeah. when they get well enough to do so, rather than coming away with a feeling of um, having been sort of treated but not understood, yeah. possibly even a bit injured in the process. Um, um, you know, you're, you're absolutely, you, you touch on a really good point where... Um you know, I, I just talked about uh, people having a stronger voice, but we actually, as a, as as health practitioners and health system people, we need to listen differently too, mm. right? We mm. need to uh, listen. We need to probe, mm. you know, and um, and to get the right diagnosis. And when I was listening to you talk, um, it, it reminded me of, of one of the other key messages, which is um, connection. And um, and so the research and all the evidence says is that uh, uh, ethnicity is important, culture is important. So um, this is a, this is a this is a blatant promotion out to our community to think about health as a career, mm. to think about becoming a health yeah. professional, yeah. health a health practitioner. Because the evidence says is that if you're sitting opposite somebody whose ethnic uh, and cultural um, background is the same as yours there's a connection and and that diagnosis is often more correct mm. um, and um, and people get better people listen mm. people you know so the evidence is there is that when you have mm. someone who's similar to you um, the outcome is, is way better so mm. please you know think mm. about health as a career think about your children and your grandchildren yes yeah getting into this yeah, it's important. Yeah, and, and 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 you don't have to be a particular type of person to be a nurse or a physio or a doctor. You know, you can be yourself. And more, you, you and have more, to care. You have to care. And I think, yeah. I think, yes, Fano, yes. Uh, excellent at that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sure. <laughs> when I was doing a master's uh, course in general practice back in the nineties, I came across a paper in an American medical journal 
describing the connectional dimension. And they studied uh, what that actually was, talking about the doctor-patient relationship yeah. and the way the patient connected with the health uh, service that they were using. I thought that was a fantastic term, the connectional dimension. First of all, that there is one. <laughs> there is a dimension called, and it's got a name, and we can study it. And we can check out whether it's at, on how far along a spectrum yeah. are, we, are we exercising ourselves in making it happen. Because someone has to make it happen. Yeah. It's, it's not just, you know, vacuous and, you know, turn a switch on and it happens. It, it, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that yeah, plays absolutely. into it, isn't there? Um, so th there was a study done a couple of years ago. We, we commissioned a study to look at the Māori workforce mm. for the central region. So what are the upper DHBs part of the central region? There's six DHBs, Capital Coast up to Whanganui and Hawke's Bay. And I looked at the Māori workforce, and, and the numbers aren't, aren't great. <clears throat> but just like the, the phrase you used, so there was a phrase in there about what I was saying uh, about this ethnic connection, right? It's called ethnic concordance, you know, where... Mm, mm. The, the patient and the professional have that have that similarity and able to have a conversation and able to connect and and get their message across. So yeah, I, I just want to say so if, think about it. Um, part of our job, part mm. of Māori Health, and part of what the DHB is to support that, is to support people getting into the into the um, into the health sector. If if people are thinking about becoming a health practitioner. Um, please do. Um, science is important, so study science at school. Don't give up on science. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's help. Yeah, and you can bring your culture too, the role you're learning. You can, you can bring all of your values to it. They're, they're important. They help you connect and to appreciate other people's values too. It's part of the dynamic, isn't it? You know, the, the statistics are really stark in that... Um, uh, the Māori population makes up 16 to 17 percent of the New Zealand population, but when it comes to health, our health is is, is poorer than others, and mm. so we use up to 30 percent of the health system mm. because uh, we need more, right? Mm. We're, we're not as healthy as other people, mm. um, and then but then when it comes to the really acute matters such as mental health, um, uh, Māori use up. 50% of the resource so it's really important that we're part of that picture we're part of the health system the other the other statistic that stands out is that Māori only make up five to six percent of the Māori uh, of the entire health workforce so there's mm. no balance there and um, not only that they're not distributed across the whole health system so we just no. need to, to to really encourage people to think about anything you know mm. whether that's phys uh, physiotherapy psychologist you know psychiatrist mm. um yeah. dentist well now we have health coaches midwife midwives <laughs> um we we have a new role in primary care which is a health coach and they're playing a really significant role um, just in being able to pick up a conversation that started with a nurse or a doctor and then tease out what the real issues are giving a person time, giving them warmth, giving them interest, not giving them a lot of technical input, not even pursuing a diagnosis at that point, but just looking at what support they need on a human level, on a family level, and making sure those things happen. And that's, a, that's their roles we've needed in, in general practice for years. You know, we've always struggled to get social workers involved in our practices, mainly because there's not been the funding for it. But now at least the, um, the value of that is recognised. Right. I'm going to play a song just to give us a bit of a break. This is going back to the pleasers uh, from, golly, way back in the 60s. And it's a song titled Hurting All Over.
left tonight I sit at home and all alone My friends will call me But I don't pick up the phone Well I feel so low down, so down I know I can't go lower There was The Pleasers with Bruce Robinson on lead guitar. Um, Bruce was uh, a mover and shaker in the mental health scene in the Wairapa for many years and very sadly died a few years ago quite suddenly in his late 60s uh, and is very much missed. Uh, some of what um, Jason and I have been talking about is very much in, in Bruce's area of interest. Um, and he did a lot of work on the community level for, for mental health. And I think he had quite strong connections with the Maori community as well. Um, well, this is Move, Mingle and Play on Thursday morning. And one of our key reasons for being here is to give you information about what's happening in the Wairarapa. Um, so I'm just going to go through a list of a few things. Tonight at 5.30 to 7.00, there is politics at the pub. The White Swan in Greytown is hosting some of our political aspirants, uh, including Mike, Mike Butterick, uh, Kieran McNulty, uh, Ron Mark, and it's uh, MC'd by Sam Rossiter uh, Steed. So if you're interested in uh, becoming better informed, uh, perhaps you're a bit on the fence as to who you're going to vote for, pop down to the White Swan tonight at 5.30 and you will be enlightened, I'm sure. Uh, so on Saturday, also in Greytown, it's Family Fun Day on the farm at the Cobblestones Museum. So starting at 11 o'clock, Saturday the 3rd of October, a fun day out for all the family. Meet our baby animals, admire all the beautifully locally grown flowers, flowers there for sale, Pro possibly Pip will be there, our friend from uh, Ruby Dahlia. See and hear how early settlers live, try your hand at washing clothes, milking our model cow, Victorian crafts, making mini sheep and more. There'll be Victorian style games, Devonshire Tees, Rides on Our Vintage Fire Engine, Lucky Dip, Experience of Old Fashioned School, and hear about Rules for Teachers. So, fun day on the farm, Saturday, Cobblestones Museum, 11 o'clock till 3. Now, we have music in the Wairapa. Wairapa does pretty well for live music. And this Saturday... 3rd of October, 8.30, at the Copthorne, Landslide are playing. They're a Fleetwood Mac and Stevie Nicks tribute show, and they have got an amazing lineup of musicians. They're an Auckland-based five-piece band, been celebrating the music of Fleetwood Mac and Stevie Nicks all over the North Island for the past seven years. 
Uh, the, some of the songs they'll be playing include Dreams, Sarah, Rhiannon, The Chain, Go Your Way, Seven Wonders, I Could Go On and On, Black Magic Woman, originally, of course, written by Peter Green. Uh, it's another story. So the, the members of the band are Andrea Clark on vocals, Brett Adams guitar and vocals, Garen Keane on keyboards, Lee Cooper playing bass and backup vocals, and Gareth Scott on drums. So look out for Landslide uh, this Saturday at Copthorne, uh, Copthorne Hotel and Resort on High Street in Masterton. You'll probably need to book tickets, and you can do that on Event Finder or going to the Copthorne. I'm sure they'll be selling tickets there. Um, now, we're moving closer to our election date, which is the 17th of October, and voting actually starts this Saturday. There are places you can go to cast your vote. There are a list of these places on the internet. I'll just read out a few of them. There's the spot in Masterton on High Street, uh, Tarangi Marie on Cole Street, uh, 38 Queen Street in Masterton. Um, not quite sure what's there, and the Masterton War Memorial Stadium. So these voting places are dotted all over town, and for those of you uh, throughout the Wairapa, find out where your voting place is. If there's any doubt about whether you can vote on Saturday, October the 17th, then please <coughs> cast your vote beforehand. Uh, I know Sandy Lidbetter uh, has got a team of people getting very busy with this and there'll be announcements, there'll be radio reports, there'll be stuff in the newspapers about it coming up. So one more uh, musical event. This is in Martinborough on Sunday, the 4th of October. Um, it's the Martinborough Music Festival. This is classical chamber music. Treats featuring some of New Zealand's finest classical music artists at the Martinborough Town Hall. It's this Sunday. It'll be in the afternoon, no doubt. Uh, actually, it starts at 11 o'clock and goes through till 5. Uh, some of the music that's going to be played is Rachmaninoff's trio, uh, Tchaikovsky, Tchaikovsky's String Sextet, uh, Dvorak, uh, Terzetto in C, Mozart String Quintet, number four in G minor, and a Brahms Piano Quintet. Uh, the musicians playing at this festival include Deirdre Irons, Monique Lappins, uh, Vasa Marti. Lepanen on violin. Deirdre, of course, is uh, playing piano, Monique violin. Nicholas Hancock's viola. Gillian Ansell on viola. Andrew Joyce on cello. And Ken Ekinosi on cello. So, Martinborough Music Festival this Sunday. And then also on Sunday, we have Why Word with a very special guest who is coming uh, from Dunedin, I think. I'll just get to her page. Michelle Alvey, a Dunedin-based writer, will be here on Sunday, 3 o'clock, at the Carterton Community Courthouse. Why Word has been going for about eight years now, started by uh, two of our local poet, poet and writers. Uh, and um, it happens once a month. And this Sunday at 3 o'clock, you're going to be able to hear Michelle Alvey give excerpts from her new book. Um, what has she written a book about? She's the assistant editor for International Best Small Fictions and founder of Flash Frontier. An adventure in short fiction. So no doubt it'll be short stories. 
with Michelle Elvey and the local uh, people who enjoy Y Word. So look out for that. Jason, I think we've um, given some news. I've done part of my job. Hmm. Have um, you had any second uh, thoughts about uh, what we were talking about before? Uh, look, I, um, I, I, what, I, what I wanted to say was um, go and vote. Go and vote, yes. Go and vote. Yes. Uh, go register to vote. Uh, find out what people are standing for. Mm. Read up on them. Um, get out there and vote. And if you don't vote, then you're just going to have to live with what everyone else says. Yes, um, yes. It, uh, you know, I, it, it's, um, you know, travel the world. Yeah. Uh, you appreciate democracy where you have a chance to have a say. And we mightn't think our opinion counts for much, but it's what happens inside of us, isn't it? When we think about it and we look at uh, what people are uh, offering us, yeah. and they're not all offering the same thing. So we need to be informed. It takes a bit of effort to get informed, talk about it with your friends, see what their opinion is, but yeah. don't make that opinion your own. Yeah. Um, you know, um, there's, there's a lot of choice out mm. there uh, mm. from from uh, right across the spectrum. Um, uh, I, I've always enjoyed uh, getting up on that Saturday, walking down to whatever booth I, I go to, um, and seeing my my fellow country people, my countrymen and women, exercising their democratic right to vote. Mm. It's so important, um, and I'm always disappointed afterwards to, to see the number of people that didn't do that. Yes, because I think you know, yes. it just doesn't cost you anything. It just you know you just no. got to register and get up and go and yeah, tick a box. Yeah, and we're really at a, a, a crossroads at the moment, aren't we? There are so many options for yeah. how we handle uh, the, the difficulties, the uncertainties, uh, the environmental challenges that face us. Look, I, I think we're on the precipice of, you know, um, the world is, is so different to 12 months ago. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the next three to five years, I think this, the impact from, from this year in particular is going to carry on for, um, uh, for, for decades, if not generations. Right, mm -hmm. you know, we just even this year that um, the people who are studying for uh, uh, you know doing their exams, it's it's so disruptive and it's it's really important that they 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 get through it. Mm. You know, it's not mm. fair. It's not fair. Everybody else had a normal year and they are impacted by it. So we just need to understand that and support them. Yeah. Um. So that so that their their career isn't ruined because of one one small event. Yes, okay. yes, exactly. Um, anyway. Yeah, we're going to have to renegotiate some things, aren't we? And, <laughs> and hopefully there's, it's a two-sided story. Well, um, I, I remember being part of a, a discussion, and it was after the lockdown, and it was a, uh, everybody was doing it, but it was a, a discussion about recovery. You know, how are we going to recover from this hu huge event? Yeah. And then a colleague of mine said, I don't want to go back to what it was like before, you know? No, um, no. You no. Know, during during the mm. lockdown, we saw the world, and we saw the world as in a better place. You know that a world without pollution, perhaps yeah. a world without worries about about you know money, mm. and um, it wasn't all perfect, but there were some things in there that that, that gave us a glimmer of hope of what the world could be. Mm. Yeah. And so um, so we started having a different conversation about resetting mm. resetting the bar and saying actually mm. the future that I want is a bit different. Yeah, it's not a, it's not as fixated on money and capitalism it's no, it's about people no, uh, no. because that's what we learned hey you know yeah, and yeah and and I, for me the biggest this the, the biggest thing that came out of out of lockdown for me was people being kind yes yeah goodness me yes. the power of being kind and resourceful too they found they Absolutely. could do things they previously either hadn't had time to do or didn't think they could you know renovations uh, chores around the house getting gardens going cooking crafts you know all that stuff uh, possibly even a few songs were written that wouldn't have been written otherwise <laughs> you know a, a bit gloomy um i mean you know you're right i mean we you know we we had the time or in in our mind we always had the time yes 
Mm. But in our minds, we had nothing else to do, right? And 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 one night we were having curry for for dinner and um, got the recipe book out and made our own naan bread. Oh, wow. oh re- what a revolution! Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and how how and it was so simple. Yes, so yeah, simple. Yeah. We just think it's too hard. Mm. Oh, so. Yeah, no, it's a very positive time as well as a challenging time at the moment, isn't it? And you're quite right. We have to get out and vote and talk about it. You know, what are the issues? Go to the meeting at the White Swan. I mean, that's, there are other ones, I'm sure. So if you want to find where you can meet the candidates, there are places where they're turning up and giving public talks. They have offices. You can go and pop in and see Ron Mark and Carterton. Uh, Kieran's got an office here in in, in Masterton, yeah. and don't assume they're all saying going to say the same things. You know, they have got opinions, they have got passions, they've got things they want to do. Um, how realistic it is is another question, <coughs> but you know, they they're people who've who've got a track record now. Also, you know, read up about the referendums. Yes, have an opinion and vote. Yeah. Exactly. Um, oh, and, and the last thing I wanted to say too is that um, uh, you know that what what you've just read out, Rob, go out and support your musicians. Yes. Go yeah. out to these venues. Go and enjoy live music. Yeah. Um, uh, I used to play in the orchestra when I was at college, and um, I played drums, but our, our music went right through, right across the spectrum, and yeah. I so I spent a lot of time listening to classical music. Yeah. Yeah. And. Um, Yes. So, you know, got a great appreciation of classical music. Yes, yes, yes. M- yes, music is n- is never, never uh, a waste of time, is it? But it does take some effort. I think we're getting to need to wind up our show here, folks, and we've only been able to play uh, one, uh, two songs, but I am going to go out with um, a very special track from the Windy City Strugglers. I'm going to play you uh, a few minutes of Margaret, written by Bill Lake and Arthur Basting. And Arthur Basting was another man who we lost recently, along with Rick Bryant, who's the singer on this song. This is Margaret by the Windy City Strugglers. Oh, 
That was Bill Lake with Rock and Roll Dream. I introduced it as a Windy City Struggler song, Margaret, written by Bill Lake and Arthur Basting. But actually, that was another track I wanted to play. Uh, So I'm sorry about about that. But uh, a beautiful song off Bill's album, uh, Home Truths, and um, sung and played by Bill. MMP's winding up for... This week, I'd just like to mention one more event that's coming up, and that's Yarns and Barns starting on Friday. Um, actually, I think it starts on Thursday next week, on the 8th. It's from the 8th to the 18th of October. And uh, you'll be able to find out all about that uh, on the Event Finder website or pop into Headley's bookshop because David Headley and his team have got a lot to do with organising yarns and barns. On Friday, Jim Bolger is uh, opening the festival at the Copthorne at 7 o'clock on Friday night. So that would be well worth going to. I'm sorry I won't be there. I'll be holidaying on the West Coast. So I'll also be away on Thursday next week. So Michael's going to step into my shoes and do the show again. So uh, have a wonderful day. Uh, I hope the world treats you well, and I hope you get a chance to reciprocate. Bye for now.